Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. I sent before you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balaam, king of Moab, devised. And what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. And what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, and that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. The voice of the Lord cries to the city, and it is sound wisdom to fear your name. Hear of the rod and of him who appointed it. Can I forget any longer the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked and the scant measure that is accursed? Shall I acquit the man with wicked scales and with a bag of deceitful weights? Your rich men are full of violence, your inhabitants speak lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Therefore I strike you with a grievous blow, making you desolate because of your sins. You shall eat but not be satisfied, and there shall be hunger within you. You shall put away but not preserve, and what you preserve I will give to the sword. You shall sow but not reap. You shall tread olives but not anoint yourselves with oil. You shall tread grapes but not drink wine. For you have kept the statutes of Omri and all the works of the house of Ahab, and you have walked in their counsels. That I may make you a desolation and your inhabitants a hissing, so you shall bear the scorn of my people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word and pray that we would sit under the authority of Scripture and that it would form our thoughts, our words, and our actions. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, several, several years ago, I'll take you back to a story several years ago. Back when I was in seminary, um, at Gordon-Conwell Seminary in Charlotte, the Charlotte campus, um, working on my Master of Divinity. I had a really busy schedule. This is going back a few years. Really busy schedule. I was taking five classes. I was a full-time student working on my Master of Divinity at the seminary. And then I was also working full-time up at the, uh, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association over there, uh, over by the airport, off Billy Graham Parkway. You guys are in Parkway. And I was working third shifts. So I'd work uh, in the evenings uh, with my buddy Jermaine, J.P., uh, we work all night together, which was fun. Uh, but, and then also I was working at Westminster Presbyterian Church in Rock Hill uh, as a pastoral intern. So that was another component on my schedule. And then I was also uh, the, the boys' varsity soccer coach at the school there, Westminster Catawba Christian School. So a busy schedule. And so basically what my schedule looked like for about a year or so, a year and a half, was I would work over at Billy Graham from about 11 o'clock to 11 in the evening until about 7 a.m. Then I'd drive home and I would sleep for a few hours. And then I would get up around lunchtime for either breakfast or lunch. It's kind of a, an awkward time. And I would study for a little bit, work on some, some papers, read. And then I'd probably have a meeting with, um, it's a large church, Westminster Large Church. So there's probably a, an army of pastors. So maybe have a meeting with Shelton, who's the main pastor, or Bill number one, or Bill number two, one of the pastors. Uh, if I didn't have that, I'd, I'd work on some papers. And then I'd go to soccer practice. And I would coach. Uh, soccer team from about 4 to 5.30, and then I would eat, take a nap, and then that night I would drive back up um, to Billy Graham and work. It was a crazy busy schedule, and it was in, the more I thought about it this week, I thought, man, what was I thinking? Um, one night I was, I was driving up. I lived in Rock Hill. Um, um, it was me and Charlie and Morrison, and I was driving up to Billy Graham, so I was up 77, and it was maybe a 20-minute drive, and I was running late, and I was going a little bit, maybe a little bit a little bit too fast, right? Uh, and the speed limit on 77 when you're going north from York County to Mecklenburg County, I think is 65. At least it was years ago. And I was probably going 10 over, maybe 15 over, something like that. And I was getting up there. I, was, I didn't want to be late because uh, they're they, they not gracious when you show up late at Billy Graham. There's no, there's no gospel there. It is legalism. It is you got to be there on time. And so I was speeding. I was going pretty quick. 
And when you cross over into North Carolina, Mecklenburg County, the speed limit drops, I think from 65 to 55. And as I'm going up, it's probably 10, 1030 that night. I'm going up and I cross Carowinds Boulevard and I cross into North Carolina and I go over, I guess, Westinghouse. And I look in the rearview mirror and there was a police officer on the shoulder with kind of the, just sitting there. And I thought, this is not good. This is, this is really not good. And I looked in the rearview mirror and had that moment of terror that many of you probably, I'm guessing most of you have had, which is you see the blue lights come on and you feel that sense of guilt. And that comes on because you're going too fast and you've been busted. So the blue lights come on, he pulls me over, and, and you can imagine my comments to him or my attempt to get out of the, the speeding tape. He pulls over and, and comes up and starts talking to me, you know how fast you're going? And my tactic was pretty straightforward. This is honest. This is a confession, I guess. Um, I just dropped Billy Graham's name as, as much as possible. Uh, I said, sir, I, you know, I work for Billy Graham, and I'm, I'm late to work at Billy Graham, and you know, I'm in seminary studying to be like Billy Graham, and you know, I just talked to Franklin last week. I mean, you would have thought, I mean, I was working hard. You would have thought me and Billy and Franklin were like best friends. Uh, I was name dropping constantly in about 60 seconds, and it did not work. It did not work. The officer, he gave me the maximum amount. He was not impressed. Uh, I think it was a North Carolina, South Carolina thing. He wasn't happy uh, that I was speeding. So I got a ticket. He gave me the full amount, which I thought, man, come on. I mean, I've got, I'm in seminary. I'm, I'm you know, trying to survive. I got this crazy landlord named Phillips who's hitting me for money every month for my room at the house. Uh, I got to pay, pay rent. Uh, so anyway, so the next month I drove up to the courthouse, Mecklenburg County Courthouse in Charlotte, to see if I get my ticket reduced and see if I could have some mercy, some grace from the judge. And so I drove up there that morning, parked the car, paid for parking, went in there, waited my turn, and stood before, stood in the courthouse for the judge, guilty of speeding. And there's, there's no getting around. I was guilty, but hoping for some mercy. And ultimately, he dropped it by, I think, 20 bucks, maybe 20 bucks. But I was guilty. I was standing before the judge that just please let me off. You know, I'm, I'm poor. I'm in seminary. I work for Billy Graham, by the way. Um, tried those things as much as possible. And ultimately, I should have just mailed my ticket in and saved the time because I was guilty. I was standing before the judge with no excuses. Guilty person for speeding. Um, and I don't think I learned my lesson then about speeding, but that's another sermon topic, another illustration. Verses 1 through 8 is, is a person standing before a judge in a courtroom. That's the imagery. It is courtroom imagery. It is, it is imagery of someone standing before a judge waiting for the verdict. And the, the imagery of verses 1 through 8 is a courtroom imagery with more drama than a speeding ticket, more drama than a Mecklenburg County courthouse. Because here you have a judge and you have a guilty party. So if you look at verse 1, verse 1 says, Hear what God says. Listen to what God the judge is going to say. Verse 2, he says, Arise, plead your case. Who is he speaking to there? God's a judge. God is speaking to Micah. Micah, stand up. We're in the courtroom. Plead your case on my behalf. Micah is God's counselor, his lawyer, his legal representation in the courtroom of God. Micah, arise, plead my case in my courtroom. Stand up. The judge is here. Stand up. God is the plaintiff. God is the judge. And Micah is the counselor. And God tells Micah figuratively, he says, I've got witnesses. I've got the mountains. I've got the foundations of the earth. These are kind of figurative, poetic witnesses. And he uses them because they've been here forever, so to speak. The mountains, the foundations, of the earth, they've seen everything. They've witnessed what God has seen. They provide evidence for the crimes that have been committed. And so God is the judge. God's the plaintiff. And Micah represents God. And the question is, who is the defendant? Who is God bringing these charges against? And there were a lot of guilty parties seven centuries before Christ. The Assyrians were a pretty bad group. They were pretty evil. We've, we've talked about them over the summer with Jonah and with Micah. Pretty bad people. They didn't believe in diplomacy. They believed in the sword and the bow and the arrow. They believed in violence. But it's not them. It's not Babylon. Babylon is beginning to build up their military seven centuries before Christ. It's not Egypt. No, the, the, the defendant is God's people. The defendant is Israel. God's bringing charges in his courtroom against his own people. This is significant. God is saying, my own people are in my courtroom, and they are declared guilty. And the theme of verses 1 through 8 can be summarized really in one word. 
one word in verses 1 through 8, and the word is what. The word is what. God says, first of all, to his own people in the courtroom, he says, what fault have you found with me? What fault have you found? Why are you treating me so poorly? Is what God is saying. Verse 3, what have I done to you, he says. This is an, an indictment on God's people. He's saying, I've done everything for you, but yet you treat me like a second rate God. You treat me like one God amongst many. You don't really follow me. And then God begins, through, through Micah speaking on his behalf, to remind his own people of what he's actually done for them. It's a history lesson. It's the importance of history, of knowing your history as a people. So in verse 4, he says, Don't you remember? You were slaves in Egypt. Slavery, one of the oldest forms of tyranny. We see it in the news a lot. It's not an American problem. It's a human problem. You can't find a country in the history of civilization that hasn't had slavery. It's a human problem because given the opportunity to take advantage of somebody else and have free labor, you're going to do it. And the history of civilization is a history of slavery. He says you were slaves in Egypt. And they were. We read about that uh, during the Exodus, the time of Moses. He says, who freed you? I did. You were slaves and I freed you. I did it for you. And then I led you through the wilderness out of Egypt. I led you across the Red Sea. Pharaoh was trying to kill you because he liked the free labor he had. And I took care of Pharaoh. And then he said, I protected you. And he references Moab and Balaam and Balak. If you remember that story, you can read about it this afternoon. They were going through Moab and the king of Moab says, I don't think we want them to pass. Let's take them out. And God protects them. God protects his people. And then he leads them across the Jordan River. That's the reference there. Into the land that was promised to Abraham. God says, do you remember all the things I did for you? You were slaves in Egypt. Oppressed people with no rights. And I freed you. And then I led you. And not only that, this is how he builds the army. He says, after that, he says, I gave you not second-rate politicians. I gave you the best leaders possible. You didn't elect these guys. I gave you the best guys possible. I gave you Moses. In the pantheon of the greats in the Old Testament, Moses is pretty much near the top, if he's not at the top. I gave you Moses. I gave you Aaron. Aaron was a great guy. He had a couple missteps there with the calf issue, but overall he had a pretty good career. Aaron did a pretty good job. I gave you Miriam. I gave you these strong leaders. So I led you out of slavery into freedom. I protected you, provided for you. I led you into the land that I had promised five centuries earlier to Abraham. And I gave you these leaders to make it happen. Reflect on that. He says, think about what I've done for you. Think about that. And what God is doing here, if you step back, what God is doing is he's bringing a covenant lawsuit in his courtroom against his own people. He's saying, I made a covenant with you. And you can read about that book of Deuteronomy, which is the first book we usually like to read. The book of Deuteronomy is just a rereading of God's covenant with his people on the plains before they go into uh, the land that's promised them. The book of Deuteronomy is a covenant with the historical prologue, the stipulations, blessings, curses. If you do this, this is what's going to happen, good and bad. God is saying, that covenant I gave you that was super clear, you guys broke it. You were covenant breakers. You were law breakers. And I'm holding you accountable because I'm holy, I'm just your covenant breakers. If you were living in the 8th century BC, if you were living outside of Jerusalem in the suburbs of Jerusalem and God brought this indictment against you, what would you say? How would you plead your case? This is kind of me in, in the courtroom in Mecklenburg. Yeah, I'm guilty, but come on, like I'm poor. Um, help me out, judge. Don't give me this beating ticket. What would you say if you were living outside of Jerusalem and God brought this case against you and against your neighbors, against your family? What would you say? God says, you're guilty of breaking the covenant. Verses 6 and 7 show us what they did say and probably what we would have said. Probably what we would have said. And again, the theme here is the word what? Verse 6. What will please you, God? What, what do you want, God? What do you want from us? That's what verse 6 and 7 says. What will be enough, God? What would be enough? Would it be enough, verse 6, if we sacrifice burnt offerings and like sacrifice a lot of things, kind of entry-level tithes, offerings? What if we, would it be enough to give 10%? Would it be enough, God, if we actually sacrifice calves a year old, things that are even more valuable than the burnt offerings? We gave some of our cattle. And the implied answer is that's not good enough. 
So they continue. It gets more and more expensive. Okay, God, what about rams? <laughs> what about rams? We've got some pretty good rams here that are worth a little bit of money. What if we offered that? Would that be enough for you, God, to back off of our case? If that's not enough, what about oil? If you think about the ancient Near East, the things they needed the most, kind of the, the, the valuable commodities, olives and grapes, because you can do a lot with olives and grapes. Oil, all the things that go along with oil, wine, all the things that go along with grapes. They say, what about the valuable oil that we produce through the olives? What if we gave you that? And not just like 10%, what if we gave you like 20%, like a lot? Would that be enough? And the implied answer is no, it's not enough. And so they go to the next thing. God, okay, what, what's enough for you, God? The most valuable thing we could give you would be our firstborn son. If we sacrifice, sacrificed our firstborn son, would that be enough? If we just step aside for a second, that seems kind of odd in the 21st century to say, sacrifice your son, that's a little bit dark. That's a little bit violent. But that really is, you have to understand, the ancient Near East, the pagan culture surrounding them, that was a fairly common practice around them. And if you went back a century earlier in Israel's history, it was a practice that they actually did involve themselves in, in Israel, in Judah, of sacrificing their son. You can read about that this afternoon in the Old Testament. They actually did do that because they were following the, the pagan groups around them where you would appease the gods and you give them the most valuable thing you have, which was your firstborn son. So he can no longer work the fields and help provide for you. You're giving him to the gods so that the gods will bring rain and provide for you. That's what they're saying. We'll give you the most valuable thing we have, which is our firstborn son. Will that be enough? And so in verses 6 and 7, the people of God said, what, what's enough, God? What do you want? We'll give you oil. We'll, give you, we'll even give our son to you. And the point here is, it's not that God's people are being generous to say, God, we'll give you, what do you want? 10%, 20%? It's not that they're being generous. It's actually the opposite of that. What they're saying is really shocking. What they're saying is this, God, what is it going to take for us to give you so that you will leave us alone? What is it going to take for us to give to you so that you just kind of bless us and back off and not press any charges? What, will it, what kind of check can we write so that you'll leave us alone? That's what they're saying which is an indictment against them. Because they don't want to have a relationship with the Lord. They just want a transactional relationship, a consumer relationship with the Lord. And it's really a breaking of the first two commandments. Have no other gods before me. And don't take my name lightly. They're breaking both of those, which leads to breaking the rest of them. And so they say, God, what do you want from us? We're trying our best. We're doing what we can. You know, We're not as bad as the, the Moabites. We're not as bad as the Assyrians. What do you want? And so God responds in verse 8 through his prophet Micah. And again, the theme is the word, what? God says, what do I want? What, you know exactly what I want What I want from you. It's been clear from the writings of, of, of Moses. It's clear in the writings of David. It's, it's clear in the ministry of people like Samuel. It was clear in the life of Joshua. It's been clear for centuries what I want from you. It's not rocket science is what he said. I want you to walk with me humbly in obedience, first of all. I want you to follow me and be faithful to me. And if you do that, it's going to lead to a just society. If you do that, it's going to lead to a kind society. For the rich people, for the poor people, and for the middle class, everyone in between, average people, for everyone. And what he's saying here, if we apply this today, that justice and kindness in a society don't flow from cultural or political agendas or movements. Justice and kindness don't flow from agendas or political movements. It flows from people following the Lord as he's revealed in Scripture. Walking humbly with him leads to kindness. It leads to justice. And that's what God says. He says, that's what I want. That's what you see in the writings of Moses and David, the ministry of Samuel and others, the writings of Isaiah and others. And today, in 2020, we read this. It's a common theme, something we see all the time. People want to talk about a just society. We want a just society. We want equality. We want fairness. And today we hear people, see people talking about, we want a kind country. We want a country that meets the needs of others, that helps those in need. And the message here is very simple. In a, in a culture, our culture, if it rejects God, you cannot have a just and kind society. If you reject God and, and live a life of practical atheism, and America seems to be, depending on 
what you look at seems to be moving that direction at times. Um, if you reject God, you can't have a just society. You can't have a kind society. You can't have a society that meets the needs of the poor and, and those in need. You can't have that. Because what we see here is if you reject God, you don't have justice. He's the one that adjudicates what's right and what's wrong. If you reject God, you do not have kindness at all. There's no motivation to be kind. But you will have agendas. You will have political movements. You will have political correctness. You will have riots. You will have mobs. You will have violence. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Uh, because without a God that we follow, it's one person imposing their views on another. And there's usually not a lot of room for dialogue when that happens. It, it turns to violence. And we've, we've seen that, sadly, um, in the news the last few weeks. Violence and blood on the streets of American cities. You see that. I mean, just the last few weeks, the, the homicide rate, the assault rate, murder rate in cities like New York, Seattle, Chicago, some of our big cities, is through the roof through the roof and it's people trying to impose their views of culture and society on others and how they should live and it's just a clear demonstration I mean this is something that's happened throughout history if you don't follow the Lord if you have a culture that will reject the Lord you will not have justice you will not have kindness because you're not walking humbly with the Lord you can't build justice and kindness and fairness on atheism or on any kind of movement that rejects God as revealed in scripture and so we see here in verse 8, a just, kind society is, is the product. It is the product of following the Lord. A society that we want, where people of every race and tribe and, and language, people group, get along and are treated fairly and equal and, and justly, only happens in a society that follows the Lord and seeks Him. And in a church, Christian church that promotes that. A Christian church that promotes that. And so verse 8, when it says... Just to nail down a little bit closer here, when it says to walk humbly with the Lord, the, the, the Arabic or Aramaic cognates have the, the idea of humbly means careful. Walk carefully with the Lord. Walk reflectively with the Lord. Have a discerning walk with the Lord. Have a guarded, protected walk with the Lord. And it shows that those that have a discerning, reflective, careful, productive, protective following of the Lord demonstrate that in their lives through how they speak to others, how they treat others. It leads to equality. It leads to fairness. It leads to kindness. And this morning, that does need to be our prayer for each of us here this morning, that we would have that kind of walk, that kind of relationship with the triune God that is reflective, that is discerning, that is careful, that is guarded, that is humble. That needs to be our prayer for Mount Pleasant, for Charleston, for the Low Country, for the Palmetto State. That needs to be our prayer for the cities I mentioned, Chicago, New York, Seattle, our country, where we see a lot of violence. A lot of violence. That we would have a country that, that follows the Lord, that walks humbly with Him. And that it's easy to say, well, it starts with the people and name the city. But it really does start with God's people. Just as the indictment here is, begins with God's people in chapter 6. It begins with us. And I say that to encourage you, not to bring condemnation, to encourage you to walk humbly with him and demonstrate that in your life, through your words, through your actions, how you treat others. That should be our prayer for our country, that we would turn from, from violence, from cultural agendas, really from practical atheism. And by, and by that I mean practical atheism, living as if, and this is America today, living as if God doesn't exist. He might be there, it's irrelevant, we're just going to live as if he doesn't exist and do our thing. That really is the, the, the impulse of America culturally, practical atheism. And if, we, if our country goes down that road, it, it leads to violence. It leads to an unjust society. So our prayer needs to be one that we would model this and live this out, first of all, before we condemn anybody. And then second of all, that others would see that in our own lives, hear that from your own mouth, and follow the triune God. That leads us to the final section here, verses 9 through 16. And these final verses give us some of the details of, the, of their sins in in Judah in, in the 8th century B.C., in God's guilty verdict. So it gives us a list of sins and God's guilty verdict. And so we'll go through these quickly. Verses 9 through 12 give us the evidence of their sin. He says, you're using false, false measures. You're cheating people in their business. We still have that problem today in 2020. The next thing he lists, he says, there's false speech. There's lies, dishonesty. We still have that problem in, in 2020. 
The next thing he lists, he says, you're defrauding others to make illegal gains. Pretty sure we still have that problem in 2020. He says, there's violence on the streets, verse 12. Still have that problem today. He says, there's deceit from the mouths of the people in Judah. Again, we still have that problem today. And interestingly here, Micah, he goes even a little bit further and does something that's really actually kind of rare in the Minor Prophets, and it only happens here in Micah. He lists specific kings by name that are guilty. And so that's why you see the mention of Ahab and Omri, two kings from about a century earlier. They've been dead and gone for generations. He uses them and says, those were your leaders. You didn't have Moses anymore. You didn't have Aaron or Miriam or anyone else anymore. You had these guys, and these guys were corrupt. They were evil. And instead of judging them and getting rid of them, you followed them. And you did what they did. And so what God does here is he lists the evidence of their sins, their crimes against him, about 700 years before Christ. And these are, as I've tried to point out, these are obviously crimes, sins that we still have trouble in in 2020. And we have not, we have not progressed beyond sin. The human heart still, apart from Christ, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, still wants to take advantage of others. Still wants to live for the self. The human heart, apart from the Holy Spirit, is empty of all virtue. Empty of truth. And seeks its own self. The men and women here in Micah's day were tempted with the same selfish desires to live for self that we are today. To live for themselves and not live for God. They had that same issue. And God says, I've told you what I want. There, there is no case for ignorance here. You cannot plead ignorance. You are guilty. You are lawbreakers. You've broken God's law. And as we think about that this morning, that courtroom imagery of God and His people, it applies to you as well. Because each of us, each of us is born into this world guilty. Each of us is born in this world a sinner. That's not my doctrine. That's biblical doctrine. That's the doctrine of original sin, of of total depravity, as we say in the Reformed tradition, meaning each part of your self, your person, is impacted by sin. That's what total depravity means. It doesn't mean you're as bad as you can possibly be and you're as evil as possible. It just means that each part of you is impacted by the fall. Genesis 3 is impacted by sin, meaning you were not born a good person who was born to love God. That's countercultural. You were not born to love God. You were born as a sinner to love yourself. Each of us was born to love ourselves. That's what happened post-fall. To live not for ourselves but for God. And because God has given us a law, meaning God's revealed what He wants from you. Here's what I want from you. He's made it clear. Here's what I want from you. Each of us has broken that law. Each of us has broken that law. We are lawbreakers. And theologically what that means is God's given us a covenant of works. Do this and you live. Live this perfect life and, and you will find life. That's what we see in Genesis. And each of us has broken that countless times because we've not lived the perfect life. We've broken that covenant of works. And so this applies to us. We are lawbreakers. <laughs> we are sinners. We are covenant breakers who have said, no, I'd rather live for myself. I'd rather not live for you, God. Each of us is guilty. And the Bible says that each of us will actually stand in God's courtroom and give an account of our life. And it's going to be a lot more than a speeding ticket. It's going to be giving an account of your life, what you've said, what you've thought, what you've done. And each of you, myself included, each of us, stands guilty apart from Christ. Each of us is guilty in God's courtroom, guilty of sin, because we've, we've been proud, we've been dishonest, we've been selfish, we've been greedy, we've been angry, we've been lazy, we've committed idol- idolatry, we've, we've committed sins. Maybe we haven't done them, but we've thought them. Maybe we've said them. And the punishment for that sin is death. Not because God is mean and angry and he just loves to bring the heat and smite people. And that's what we see in the Old Testament. No, it's because God's holy and just. That's the God you want. One who will punish wickedness. But we have to put ourselves in that mix. We are, we are sinners. And the sentence is death. It's not probation. It's not purgatory. It's not a speeding ticket. It's death. And not just physical death. It is spiritual death separated from God for all of eternity. We see that in Scripture very clearly. 
Paul says in his letter to the Romans, he says the wages, the punishment of sin, the payment of sin, when you cash it in, is death. Eternal death. You see that in the end of Revelation, John's, John's Apocalypse, the last book of, of the New Testament. He says there is a second death, a spiritual death that is eternal, that you are separated from God. In the Bible we see that as, as hell or Hades. Isolated from God forever. The misery of hell forever. Not because God is mean and unjust, but because He is just and He is holy. And we're sinners. That's, that's the law of God. It's bad news. It's really bad news. And if we stop there this morning, it would be very depressing. <laughs> but the Bible gives us good news in, in light of that. And this is what Mike is wanting the people to hear. This is what I'm wanting you to hear this morning. That even though you are guilty based on your life, if you stand in God's courtroom, and you will, if you stand there on your own, trusting in yourself and what you've done and how good you've been, the good things you've said and the good intentions that you've had in your church attendance and whatever it might be, you are guilty. You are guilty. But if you stand there and you stand there trusting in Christ and resting in Him, you're declared not guilty because what Christ has done, he has, He's fulfilled that covenant of works. He's lived that perfect life for you. He was born perfect. He lived a perfect life. And he offered that life as a sacrifice on the cross for your sins. The, the interesting part here is in Micah 6, the people said, well, God, we'll give you our firstborn son, which they wouldn't even do. What does God do? God gives his firstborn son, his only son, the firstborn of all creation. He gives his son and says, you won't do that, but I will do that to redeem you because you're guilty apart from Christ. That's what he does. That's pretty good news because it means you don't have to give up your life. Because God has already given his only son on the cross for you. He's done what the people of Israel said they might do, they might consider doing to appease God. God has done that for you. He offers his life as a perfect sacrifice so that when you stand before God, and every person will stand before God, you can be declared not guilty because of what Christ has done for you, because his righteousness is reckoned to your account. Call that imputation. It is reckoned to your account. That you were seen as righteous because of what he's done. And because of that, your sins are forgiven. You are welcomed into God's family. You're adopted into God's family. And you are freed from the slavery of sin. And the punishment of death because of him. That's really good news. That's pretty good news. And so this morning as we, uh, this weekend we celebrate the freedom that we have in America. And we, we, I want to highlight that because so many Christians around the world do not have that. But we have that freedom. As we celebrate that, we also celebrate the freedom that we have, spiritual freedom, because of what Christ has done. Because you were in bondage and slavery to sin apart from him, facing a destiny of eternal death. That is the law of God. That is clear. But because of the work of Christ, you have the hope of eternal life. You go to God's courtroom with confidence because Christ stands in your place. He's taken on that guilt himself at the cross and atoned for your sins. That is really good news. That is really good news to celebrate this morning. And, and as we go to the sacrament, the bread and the juice, it is signified, that promise is signified and sealed in the bread and the juice so that when our faith is, is struggling, we can have it in a visible form to encourage us in our faith this morning. Let's pray.